Good morning to everyone here. Can we just celebrate that the sun has been out? It's exciting. I'm so glad that the sun has been out, that it's warmer now. However, growing up in Chicago, I've realized, and I don't, I don't uh, get too excited because I know that snow can still come in May, so I don't wait. I, I wait until Memorial Day weekend. That's when I know that it's finally going to get warm. But you know what? The sun, we can celebrate that, that the sun is out. Uh, there's another reason we should celebrate. I found out that there's a special couple in this church, Uncle Matt, Auntie Beth, who celebrated 53 years of marriage this past Thursday. Can we give God a round of applause? I know Uncle Ma told me not to mention anything, but I just had to. It would be wrong if I didn't mention that. That's an amazing feat, an amazing, uh, amazing thing to celebrate. So praise the Lord for that. I'm so glad to hear that. Friends, we're excited that you are here today in, in, uh, at, at Hinsel Philam Church. Those of you here uh, in the sanctuary, I know that there are several families who are away because their children are graduating in other universities. So th that's... That's why some of the families aren't here. And those of you watching online, we are glad that you are here as well. We are in a sermon series entitled, I Am Not the Same, How Jesus Reshapes Me. I'm Not the Same, How Jesus Reshapes Me. We start on, Mar on March 23, and we have two more Sabbaths, two more, two more teachings today and then next week. And we're in this series because we're trying to learn and find out what happened to people who met Jesus and encountered Jesus. How were they changed and how were they reshaped? I've been sharing this quote with you and I shared here these past few weeks, I read a book entitled Live No Lies by John Mark Comer. It's an amazing book and he says here in his, one of his lines on, on page 92, he says, what we give our attention to will shape the persons that we become. What we give our attention to will shape the persons that we, that, that we become. Now, as human beings, all of us have been shaped. We've been shaped by our family of origin. We've been shaped by the friends that we hung out with. We've been shaped by our neighborhoods. We've been shaped by our schools. We have been shaped by, if you're a religious person, we've been shaped by religious uh, communities. We've been shaped by the ideas and the songs and the things that we see, that our eyes behold. We are being shaped, and John Montcomer, I'm with him. What we, I believe this, what we give our attention to will shape the persons that we become. And I've been thinking to myself, what kind of person do I want to become when I'm 80? Do I want to be a person who is grouchy or a person that is happy. You know the, when you're on a trip with kids and you've heard this before, you're driving, you're driving to, let's say you're going to California, right? Driving to California out west, you're driving for five hours and then your kids in the car say, are we there yet? And you say, not yet, we still have 17 hours. One hour later, what do they say? Are we there yet? The ch and then you say, not yet, 16 more hours. Dad, mom, are we there yet? You just asked two minutes ago. We're not there yet. What's happening? The children really want to get there, but they are also skeptical that you're telling the truth. They're really doubting you. They are uncertain if you're telling the truth, and they keep asking over and over and over and over again. This morning, we're going to study this one character. Many have labeled him Doubting Thomas in John chapter 20. We'll be in verses 24 through 31. We're going to learn about doubt and skepticism. We're going to ask some questions. One, what is doubt? And also, are, are there, is there good doubt? Is there such thing as a good doubt, right? So the first question we're going to ask is, what is doubt? And then the second question what we're going to seek to answer is, how do we believe in spite of our doubts? Okay, so what is doubt? How do we believe in spite of our doubts? So let's go to John chapter 20. If you don't have a Bible, you can open up the Bible in the pew in front of you. Uh, if you don't have one, a physical Bible, that's okay. Pull out your smartphone or your tablet. If you don't have one, you, there's a, there's, there's, you can look at the bulletin. The passage is in the bulletin. Join us 
as we read this story of doubting Thomas. But before we start, let's pray one more time. Father, we're going to read your scripture. And by doing this, we are hoping and praying that our souls and our character will be shaped by you. And so please teach us today and shape us to be people like of love. In Jesus' name, amen. John 20, we're going to start with verse 24, but just a little bit of a background. You see, Jesus was just crucified on Friday. Mary Magdalene and some of the other disciples, they went to his tomb and they were, they were shocked. He's not there. This is Sunday morning. They went to the tomb. Jesus is not in the tomb. Mary stood outside the tomb crying her heart out. Where is Jesus? Where is my Savior? Two angels appeared and asked Mary, Mary, why are you crying? And she said, I don't know where they put Jesus' body. Jesus appeared and he said, he surprised her and said, Mary, Mary Magdalene recognized that it was Jesus. And she was elated. She was on cloud nine. She was thrilled. What? Jesus, the disciples, she, so Mary Magdalene runs to the disciples and say, I have seen Jesus. And the disciples are, are shocked. And they said, are you sure you've seen Jesus? The disciples are surprised too. They are shocked too. And that same Sunday night, most of the disciples, they come together. They lock themselves in a, room, in a room. They're scared now that they're going to be harassed by the Jewish leaders. You know, those who were uh, behind crucifying the Messiah. And they also locked in the room, themselves in the room, surprised and shocked by the news that this Jesus that, they, that they, they followed for three and a half years, this news that he is alive. They are shocked. All of a sudden, Jesus appeared in the room and he says, peace be to you. The disciples, their jaws dropped. What? Jesus? They were scared. They were scared because they, the, the doors were locked, but he still came into the room and he appeared. And in the midst of their shock, they were so excited to see, to see Jesus, to see the Messiah. They were on cloud nine. The disciples were elated. They were overjoyed. Like when you bring your child to get their favorite ice cream at Oberweiss, they were overjoyed to, to, to see the Messiah. But you know what? One of the disciples was missing. One of them was missing. Notice what the text says now, John chapter 20, verse 24. And I read, Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, that's, that's uh, another way to translate that is the twin, he was one of the 12, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. And then notice what Thomas says in verse 25. And some of us can relate to this. But so the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord, Thomas. You missed out, man. We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, look what the text says in verse 25. Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Come on, that's too incredulous. That's, that's too, that, that, that's just mind-boggling. That, that doesn't make any sense. Unless, unless I take my very own finger, stick it in his hand, touch him on his side, and see it for myself, I will not believe. Come on, Thomas. Who was Thomas? We don't know a lot about Thomas. In fact, the, the gospel writer John who writes this is the only one who describes Thomas's behavior and interactions with Jesus. Thomas was not always a skeptic and he wasn't always a doubter. Thomas is mentioned in a few places in the New Testament in John chapter 11 and John chapter 14 and he appears as a loyal follower. I'm going to follow you, Jesus. I'm going to follow you, Jesus. But notice at the end here, after three and a half years, Thomas is no longer a loyalist. He is more of a doubter. It's interesting. You know, I was thinking, I was thinking, uh, I was listening to a podcast by Kerry Newhoff. He was speaking to another leader and they, he, he was talking about 
uh, this idea of cynicism. Do you know what cynicism is? Cynicism is this, this, uh, the feeling of, yeah, I don't really know. He might be saying that, but I don't really believe him. Or she might be saying that, I don't really believe her. And, and the church says this, but I don't really believe what the church says. It's this belief that no one has it right. Like you're just cynical of what people share. And you're, you're cynical. And the question that I wonder about, and the book that I, the question I wonder about is, what makes people cynical? There's a book that I read, I just picked up this week, called Didn't See It Coming by Kerry Newhoff. He was a he was a church planter. He was a lawyer first, church planter, and now he has this, this podcast on leadership that's growing. His book is entitled, Didn't See It Coming, Overcoming the Seven, the seven Greatest Challenges That No One Expects and Everyone Experiences. I just finished the two chapters, and you know what the first uh, greatest challenge that he talked about? It was the, the challenge of cynicism, that you just become cynical, right? You, you, and, and why is it that people become cynical? Well, because you expect something and people, people hurt you. You're, you, know, you expect something from your spouse and they, they let you down. You expect something from your friend, they let you down. Uh, you expect something from a religious leader in this church space or in a church space. And then they behave a certain way and then they let you down. And you see it over and over and over again and you become cynical. And why do you become cynical? Because all the hope that you had is shattered. And that's why people become cynical. And, and he writes in his book, Kerry Newhoff says that in my 30s and my 40s, as I'm pastoring and leading a church, I realized that I just became really, really cynical. And he thought to himself, and this is, what, this is the turning point when he reached a, a burnout moment, when he reached emotional burnout. Kerry Newhoff said, I started asking myself, who do I want to become when I turned 80? Do I want to be, continue to be a cynical person? Because when I'm 80 and people are eulogizing and remembering me at my funeral, do I want to be known as someone who was cynical and grouchy or someone that had hope and happiness and joy? And it was when he hit that breaking point and he was curious about why he was cynical that his, his life uh, turned 180 and said, you know what? This cynicism, this lack of hope, it's not helping. And I wonder for myself, who is the person that I am today? What kind of questions am I asking now? And how is that going to shape me when I'm 80? Because as Karen Newhoff says, who we are in our 20s, 30s, and 40s, and the habits, and the character, and the questions, and the person that we are now, gets pretty much cemented and locked in in our 60s, 70s, and then 80s. And I'm asking myself, how can I become a person of love and that experiences love and joy and not become a doubting Thomas and a skeptic and, and someone who is a cynic? Perhaps Thomas became a doubter because he was so shattered by the fact that the teacher whom he was devoted to was just crucified. All of his eggs were in this basket, the Messiah, and he was supposed to be the king that delivered us from Roman rule, and now he's crucified. And all of those eggs that were in that basket, were, they just crashed and they, 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 they went splat all over the ground. They just crushed. All of his hopes were crushed and shattered. And maybe that's why he was skeptical. And maybe that's why in verse 25 he says, unless I have unquestionable evidence, I will not, buy, not believe. Listen up. Read my lips, my disciple friends. Unless I have in, uh, uh, unquestionable evidence, I will not believe. And friends, you know, this, these are just generalizations, and maybe you might agree. I've observed that there are at least two types of people on this planet. And some of you can identify with this. There are some people that are evidence-based people, okay? These are people who need airtight evidence. The logic has to line up. The, the, the philosophical foundations have to line up. The premises have to be tight in order to believe something. I remember having ongoing conversations with someone uh, several times a month. This is a few years ago, uh, four years ago. He was an agnostic, okay? Someone who wasn't a hard atheist, but but he was open, at least open to conversing about God. I would share 
evidence after evidence after evidence with my agnostic friend. And they were really amazing conversations. I learned so much in these conversations. And I, I was sharing these thoughts and this perspective. And what I realized is that it did not matter how much evidence I shared with my friend, it would not shift his mind. My friend needed overwhelming evidence that Jesus was God. He needed to see it, okay? So you have people who are evidence-based people. Do you have any people like that, or do you know someone who is more evidence-based? A second type of person that I see and that I've observed are people that are, are practical. They're just practical people. I remember one time preaching a sermon here, and after church, uh, this young lady came to me, and, and, and she said, hey, that was, that was great that you shared what you shared, but then she asked, well, how was this practical? And that, that's a good reminder to me as a preacher, right? Don't stay up here in the clouds with philosophy. Bring it down to earth. Put some legs on the sermon and make it practical. You have people on earth here, the people that are friends, our family, maybe some people here, you watching online, maybe. Uh, some are more philosophical. I want evidence. Or some are more practical. It seems that Thomas is more of an evidence-based person. He needs undeniable evidence in order to believe this unbelievable story. And so Thomas is doubting his friend's story. Question for you. What is doubt? What is doubt anyway? What is doubt? Doubt is a feeling of uncertainty when we question the truth about something. Doubt is a feeling of uncertainty when we question the truth about something. The year was 2017. Catherine was pregnant with her first child. We were in Hawaii for our baby moon. And my good friend, Taj Pakleb, he, he, uh, he was taking us, uh, giving us a tour of Oahu, okay? And it was really cool to get like the inside. He grew up in Oahu, so he knew the secret places. And he took us to a special place. Hey, the tourists don't go here. I'm like, oh yeah, really? So he took us to this cove, and he said, hey, Nestor, Catherine, trust me, it's safe, okay? Let me tell you something. Like, I, I, I'm, I'm a decent swimmer, but the waves were crashing in that cove. And I'm like, I'm not about to lose my life, and my wife is pregnant, okay? So, but, but Taj is comfortable. You know, he always swims. He's, he's literally like a fish when I swim with him. And, and so, so, so Taj says, hey, it's going to be okay. Just put this snorkel on and the fins on, and we're going to be okay. And so we're, we're swimming and enjoying our time, and the waves are literally crashing up on us, and, and Catherine gets nervous. And, and she says, hey, I need to go back. And so we help her back. And I'm terrified because my wife doesn't want to go. But Tasha, it's okay. I'm going to take some pictures of you. And I'm like, dude, I can't smile, man. Like, I, I, I can't smile. He said, no, it's okay. Just try, follow me. So we go in the water and we're swimming. And, and, and I'm fearing for my life because the waves were just crashing. And then we go in the water. And then Taj goes into the water, okay. And then he picks up a sea urchin. And he takes a sea urchin and he says, Nestor, he puts it in my hand and he said, okay, smile now while you're holding the sea urchin. I'm like, I am, I'm scared I'm going to die here, right? I'm thinking this in my head. And, uh, and so I do my best to smile and I'm like, dude, I think I just signaled to him in the water, it's time to go back. So then we swim back and let me tell you something, okay? I've, I doubted Tosh. I doubted Taj. I felt very uncertain when he said that it would be easy. And I felt very uncertain and uneasy when the waves were crashing on me, in, when the waves were crashing on me. I was terrified. Thomas feels uncertain because he's questioning the truth about Jesus' resurrection. He is emotionally uneasy because he does not trust what his friends are saying. And here's a critical question, and I'm curious what your answer is. Is it ever okay to doubt? Is it bad to doubt? Is it bad to doubt? To those of us who belong to what we'll call the majority world, the, the, the Western world would be considered U.S., uh, Europe, Australia, New Zealand, okay? This is just broad, broad strokes. Uh, Western civilization is all built on questioning, okay? But those in the majority world, those of Latin America descent, African descent, American descent, even Middle Eastern descent, 
what we are often taught is never question authority because that's a cultural thing. Because what the elder says is the final word, right? And that's, that's a cultural thing. And let's, I mean, let's just own that. It's a cultural thing, right? I mean, I, had, I know someone I know in my extended family who was questioning, well, why should I, why should I believe that, I don't know, Jesus, is the, I should, why should I believe the Bible? Well, they're like, why are you asking questions? Well, it's because, because we say so. Because we say so? Question, is it bad to doubt? Yes and no, okay? Yes and no. I believe that there are two types of doubt. Let me describe the first kind of doubt. We're gonna call this destructive doubt. Can you say it with me? Destructive doubt. Destructive doubt is when you question truth in order to reject it. Let me give you an example. In, in this storybook, the Bible, in Genesis chapter three, right in the beginning, uh, you see God creating the world. He creates Adam and Eve, Genesis 1 and 2. And then in Genesis 3, this enemy comes on the scene. He's known as a serpent. And do you know what the first thing, you know the first words that come out of the serpent's mouth? He says to Eve while she was all alone, did God really say you must not eat fruit from that tree? Did God really say that you must not eat fruit from the tree? What was the enemy doing? The enemy's doubt and his question is destructive because he wants all people to reject God or reject, reject that authority. And friends, can I just share something with you, especially us living in this Western world? Have you guys heard of the term deconstruction? Have you guys heard of that recently? Okay, especially those within uh, the Gen Z and, 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 and millennials. We're swimming in a world that is deconstructing everything. We live in an age where all truth and absolutes are being just deconstructed. Where does this come from? Okay? Some of you are like, what does that mean? You, you, feel this, you feel deconstruction when your teenagers or your youth are just like, why should I believe in that? Are questioning you. Right? That's, where is this coming from? John Mark Comer in his book, Live No Lies, he writes about this term called truth decay. Okay? And let me share, with this, let me share this, this paragraph with you. And you'll know that he's, you'll see how he's not indicting just one political party. It's actually both. And he's kind of, you'll see what John Mark Comer says. Listen here, listen, listen to what he says. He says, speaking about this idea of truth decay, right? Moral absolutes are, being, are, are decaying. This is a cancer of integrity that's infected both the left and the right. In her leftist expose of the Trump administration, The Death of Trump, former chief book critic for the New York Times, Michiko Kakutani, was at least honest enough to admit that this war on truth did not start on the right, right, with, with uh, the former president or Breitbart News, but much earlier with French philosophers like Foucault and Derrida. This was here in the U.S. in the 1950s, well, here in, here in Europe. But in the 1950s, all right, about 50, 60, 70 years ago, there was these philosophers who were coming on the scene and, and planting these ideas in our, in our universities, right? He continues, these left-leaning thought leaders spread the ideas of postmodernism and moral relativism deep into the nervous system of America academia. And this began a university-based movement toward a post-truth society as all truth became relative, or worse, a form of oppression in need of tearing down. Friends, this is the water that we're swimming in, and no longer can we keep our hands in the sand. This is the water that we are swimming in today, and the dis destructive questioning of all authority has caused us as a society to be highly suspicious and highly cynical. And friends, some of you feel this allergy to authority. You feel it at school. You feel it at work. You feel it in your friend circles. And Christianity, many of us who identify as Christians, Christianity today in today's culture is seen as a form, a form of oppression that needs to be torn down. And so here's my question. What happens to a society that rejects Jesus? You see, what did Jesus teach, by the way? Jesus taught love. He came to love, and he came to heal the brokenhearted. That's who he is. And what happens is when we reject Jesus and the Christian faith, we are actually rejecting the very resources that help us to be loving human beings on planet Earth. 
And thus, by rejecting Jesus, who is the epitome of love, in my opinion, we become a more divided and hateful society. Let me illustrate it this way. Have any of you heard of Martin Luther King Jr.? Okay? The, the leader, right? The champion of the civil rights movement. Martin Luther King Jr. was a civil rights leader who peacefully protested against systemic racism in our country. And it boggles my mind in the, in, that in the land of the free, that, that, uh, that, 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 that systemic racism was part of our country, that slavery was part of our country, right? And here's the question. What resources allowed Martin Luther King Jr. Now, he wasn't a perfect man. I'm reading his biography slowly. He wasn't a perfect man. But what resources allowed Martin Luther King Jr. to protest against oppression, but to do it in a way that was nonviolent? Where did he get his resources? It was the truth of Jesus. It was the truth of the Christian faith. Jesus tells us to love the oppressed by standing for them. And yes, we should stand for those who are disenfranchised and those who are struggling and hurting. But Jesus also tells us at the same time to love the oppressor as well. Love the oppressed and stand for them. But love the oppressor. Love the victims, but also love the villains as well. Are you serious? And do you know what our culture says? Our culture, coming down from Derrida and Foucault from the 1950s or so, or 1960s, tells us, tear down, the op- tear down the oppressors. Stand for the victims and tear down the villains. Take them down. It never gives us the resources to love the villains too. And that's why our culture, politically, racially, gender, socioeconomic, there are great divisions in our country because we have no longer have the resources to stand up for what is right and to do it in a way that still causes me to love and to sit at the table with my enemies. And this is what's happening in our country. Destructive doubt causes us to reject truth. And by doing so, we actually become creatures devoid of love. And friends, I do not want to become that. I don't. And I'm asking God to help me. But here is another category of doubt. Destructive doubt on on this side, but on the other hand, we have healthy doubt. Unlike destructive doubt that is motivated to reject truth, healthy doubt asks questions in order to grow. To have healthy doubt is when we ask questions in order to grow and to thrive. Do you remember the feeling, some of those of you here who have bought a home for the first time? Have you guys heard of buyer's remorse? It is scary. My wife and I, we were in Colorado, and the realtor says, okay, you're going to have to sign today. Well, seriously, I mean, that's a huge down payment. We've never given that kind of down payment before in our lives, right? That's healthy doubt because we want to take a calculated risk. Another example of healthy doubt was uh, three summers ago in 2021 when Catherine and I were trying to find a house. We saw 26 homes in three days. It was exhausting trying to find a place here, right? Right? We found a nice place in Bolingbrook, and we thought, well, our kids are going to go to the academy. We don't want to hit I-55. There's too much. So let's find somewhere else. And after seeing 26 homes, we had healthy doubt because we wanted to take a calculated risk, right? And thankfully, the one house that we saw in Lyle, which I liked, but we were still questioning, you know, we still had some healthy doubt, it dropped in price. We're like, oh, cool. So then, so we checked it out. And we took a calculated risk, and out of those 26 houses, we finally locked in. We took a calculated risk on that house, and thank God it's still attached and it's still up, right? Healthy doubt is okay. We, we, we doubt all the time. We, we, healthy doubt is okay. In fact, Jesus also had healthy doubt. There were some Pharisees that, Pharisees that were uh, trying to plot against him, and you know what they said? Okay, let's, let's take Jesus down. So let's go to him. Let's ask him a question. All right, God, we got him. We got him. Hey, Jesus, uh, should we pay taxes to Caesar or not? Okay. Did Jesus accept their, their, uh, their, really their threat at face value? No. He doubted them. He says, well, let me ask you a question with a question. Whose inscription is on the coin? Hmm. Caesar. Brilliant answer. He said, well, give to Caesar that is, which is Caesar's. 
and give to God that which is God's. What is Jesus doing? Jesus is doubting and he's questioning the Pharisees to counter their plot to trick him and also to help us thrive in our country by respecting the government while we respect God. Healthy doubt is vital because it allows us to think critically and actually own our beliefs and faith. And friends, I just want to speak especially to those of us who consider ourselves believers and have grown up in the Christian tradition. Some of us are here as Christians because the faith has been passed down to us by our parents and their parents and their parents and our friends and our church and school. All of these, these uh, forces are shaping us and have shaped who we are today. But I have a question for you, friends. Have you ever really asked the question, why do I believe in Jesus? Why do I, have, have, have you asked the question, have I asked the question, have I owned it? Why is it that I believe in Jesus? And friends, can I share something with you that I've learned? I've learned that just because a preacher or a teacher is shouting or, or passionate about something or saying it with conviction, that that leader or teacher or parent isn't always right because guess what? That used to be me even as a pastor seven, eight, nine, ten years ago. I would say things with passion and authority, but yet I've shifted in the last six years. And so I began to even doubt like, okay, I mean, just because someone is passionate, it doesn't mean it's true. And, I have, and, and ultimately, my faith isn't based on what a teacher or my parent or what a friend or a religious leader says. Ultimately, it's shaped by what Jesus says. And if you ask questions about your faith for the purpose of growing in your faith, if you have healthy doubt, you will thrive and you will actually own your faith instead of being part of a tradition because you grew up in it. And to be married, to, to be, I'm not, I'm not knocking arranged marriage. I know some people do it yeah, in different countries. But to be told, well, this is who you're going to marry is, is not as enjoyable as having a choice and to own the process of choosing a spouse. And I want to encourage us to, 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 uh, to ask the questions and ensure that we're, we're, we're rooting ourselves in Jesus, not what other people say, but what Jesus. And Thomas thinks in verse 25, unless I see the holes in Jesus' side and his hands, listen up, I'm not going to believe. I'm just not going to believe. And I wonder, what if Thomas asked instead of saying, you know, you know, instead of saying, I need to see strong evidence in order for me to believe. What if he were to reframe the question and ask, what would it take for me to believe? What if he were to change the question? I wasn't planning on sharing this, but this, there was a quote that I read last night. I, was, I review my quotes several times a week that I highlight in my, my Kindle. Let me read to you something that I think you'll, you'll relate to in terms of reframing. Okay? And this is a practical way that can help us as we have healthy doubt. So Edwin Friedman, in my opinion, this is the best leadership book I have ever read so far. It's called A Failure of Nerve, right? Uh, leading in a world of quick fixes. Let me give you an example of this, and I think many of us can relate. This is regarding parenting, but this can relate to all relationships. A more familiar example would be the mother who is perpetually trying to seek answers to the question of how to make her child more responsible. Okay, so you have the parent. And the parent's asking, what can I do to make my child more responsible? Okay, so this is what Friedman says. She will be on a frustrating treadmill until she is able to focus on her own development rather than her child's. Oof. Let's keep going here. For example... One mother spent years trying to find new ways of getting her kids to do their homework despite the fact that she knew she had been completely ineffectual, right? Finally, she was so fed up with it. I mean, we've done that, right? Just do this, do, do, do. You keep telling people what to do and hopefully they'll change their behavior. And you know what Friedman says? And by the way, he's a, he's a rabbi and a therapist that worked with hundreds of couples and organizations to help them through this, this mess of anxiety. Finally, she had a shift she started to have healthy doubt and question her own methodology. And she said to the kids, you know what, guys, this is crazy. You're going to save me a lot of money if you don't go to college. 
from now on, every time you catch me commenting on your schoolwork, school you can find me a dollar. I was like, that's radical. Notice what he says. As a result of reframing the question from how do I motivate my kids to how do I regulate myself, she not only found them doing far better, but a chronic backache that had bothered her for years mysteriously disappeared. Edwin Friedman says that we live in a world that likes to bl displace blame. It's always the other that's the fault, that's, that's the problem. And if I just have a quick fix and a remedy and tell that person that this is what you need to do, then they will finally measure up to my standards and everything is going to be okay. But you know what happens? You think that creates a culture of peace and joy? It doesn't. And so what is he suggesting? He's suggesting instead of focusing on the other, perhaps I need to focus on myself. And I won't share who, but there was a leader friend that I was speaking to this week, okay? And I shared these words, and we both agree, that boundaries, boundaries are the soil for breakthroughs. Boundaries. This is how we're going to communicate. This is what you're going to do. This is how, if you're not going to do your homework, we're going to draw a boundary, and you're going to take responsibility for your own life. I'm not responsible for your life, and this is where the boundary is drawn. Boundaries. Boundaries. Are the, is, are the soil for breakthroughs. And I wonder what would happen if Thomas would have reframed the question and would have asked, if I just have enough evidence and he shows me enough evidence, I believe, what if he were to put it on himself and ask the question, what would it take for me to believe? What if we were to do that? What if he did that, but Thomas didn't do that? His doubt his doubt seems healthy, but it appears that his doubt was destructive because he says, if not, I will not believe. And so what is doubt? Doubt is a feeling of uncertainty when we question the truth about something. Last question, how do we believe in spite of our doubts? How do we believe in spite of our doubts? Let's read here verses 26 through 28. The Bible says, John 20, verse, starting with verse 26, a week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, oh, this is so crazy, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. The same thing he just said to the disciples seven days prior. Peace be with you, verse 27. Then he said to Thomas, all right, Thomas, come on here, come, come over here. Let me see your finger. All right, I see your finger. Put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side and then notice what Jesus says. I'm in the New International Version. Stop doubting and believe. And then what does Thomas say in verse 28? Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. You know, Thomas was in disbelief, but Jesus appears out of nowhere. Jesus pursues Thomas and gives him the tangible evidence that he needs to believe that he is really alive. Isn't this good news, friends, that this Messiah, Jesus, he pursued Thomas and Thomas engages with Jesus? How do we believe in spite of our doubts? When you are uncertain, engage with Jesus anyway. When you have uncertainty, and I promise you, doubt never stops as long as you're a thinking, breathing human being. You're always going to be asking questions. Even in the midst of your uncertainty, engage with Jesus anyway. Some people think, I need to be 100% certain about my faith in order for Jesus to engage with me. And my answer to that is unequivocally, unabashedly, no. Jesus asks us to engage with him while we have questions and while we have doubts. Friends, it's okay to ask Jesus questions. It's okay. He loves to show how he's the answer to our deepest questions and how he gives us the evidence that we need in order to believe. And friends, to engage with Jesus means, it means that I make time regularly, ideally, daily, ideally, always, moment 
by moment. We make time for Jesus that I'm always in continual conversation with Jesus. Sometimes it's times of solitude when it's just me without the kids in Starbucks sitting there opening my Bible and journaling and praying to God. And sometimes it's in the car while I'm driving or even with a, with a patient or with my students working with them. Uh, Engaging with Jesus means that I, take, I make time regularly for Jesus. It means that I regularly read and meditate on the Bible, not to just get information, but to get Jesus himself. And friends, if you're on the fence about believing in this Jesus, man, I would encourage you to engage with Jesus anyway. Engage with him anyway. Verse 29 says this. He told Thomas, Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. You see what Jesus told Thomas? Because you, Thomas, have seen me, and this is about 2,000 years ago, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. What does Jesus mean by this? Blessed, it's another word for happy. Happy and content are those who have not seen but still believe. Who is Jesus talking about? He's talking about you. He's talking about me. Jesus is talking about us. Has anyone here had the privilege of seeing Jesus face to face? We, none of us. Maybe some have seen Jesus in a vision or a dream. If you have, let me know. That's awesome. I, I just haven't had that experience. None of us have had the chance to see Jesus face to face 2,000 years ago. We weren't there. But many of you here believe or are at least beginning to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And why is that? Why do we believe even though we haven't seen him? Well, the text says here in verses 30 and 31, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Why do we believe even though we haven't seen Jesus face to face? Well, the reason we believe is because we trust that John was a real eyewitness of Jesus. And that we trust that John wrote this so that we, 2,000 years later, would have enough evidence to take a dive into the, the beautiful waters, the beautiful living waters of Jesus. John saw Jesus face to face. So we have sufficient eyewitness evidence, but it's not airtight evidence. We have sufficient evidence. In other words, we know enough, but we still need to take a risk. We still need to take a calculated risk and jump in the water and make that down payment. We still have to take the risk and follow him. Friends, it is true that while I'm uncertain that I should engage with Jesus anyway, why should I do that? Last verse, and I praise his team is going to come up and share with us this song. The text says here in verse 27, Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand, and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Jesus is asking us, those of us who are uncertain, to engage with Jesus anyway. Anyway. Why should we do that? Because Jesus really has holes in his hands. The Messiah, if we believe in the scripture, really has a hole in his side. He really, I believe as a believer in Christ, that he has holes in his hands and his side. And when Jesus was facing uncertainty in the Garden of Gethsemane, not knowing if he should go through with the sacrifice of dying on the cross. When Jesus was on the cross feeling the eternal separation, when he cried out to his father, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When Jesus was uncertain, he still chose to engage with me and you anyway. And it is because of his engagement with me and because he has holes in his hands and his feet, that's why I choose to still engage with him even though I have my questions. And there's someone here today, maybe those of you watch, someone watching online, that is, that is, 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 is sensing the need to begin that journey of engaging with Jesus for the first time or once again. 
And friend, I want to tell you something. Don't hesitate because you are missing out on amazing, mouth-watering living water. I promise you. Take that calculated risk. Engage with him. Touch his hands and his side. Receive him. And if you're a first-time guest, let us know. We want to give you a gift in the mail. Fill this card out. We have a connect card on the screen. We have this connect card that we'd love you to fill out. If you are saying, I want to reconnect, I want to join a Bible study group, I want to be baptized, we had an awesome baptism last week, let us know as a pastoral team because we want to come alongside you in your journey with Jesus. Our friends, fill this out. You can put the connect card in the, in the offering plate on the way out. Just want to let you know that today you can experience the joy of engaging with Jesus. So let's sing about his love as we sing this closing song with our praise team this evening, uh, this morning.